All right, so at this point, what we're going to do, um, get back focused, in this case, on the property types, talk about industrial development. Then what we're going to do, talk a little bit about the tests coming up next week. Then whatever remaining time we have, you can go back into your groups, finish up what you need to, because I, I can tell that the two groups back there, definitely y'all got some work to do to kind of get everything sort of set up. So I know your group is pretty well done with most everything I think that you need to do. I know your group, you pretty well got everything under control. So um, from that standpoint, probably the best use of our time collectively would be go ahead and let's talk about the industrial development stuff. And then, as I said, talk about the exam, and then whatever time is left over, then you guys can kind of work in your groups, and some of you that are done, go home. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about industrial development. Last semester, those of you that were enrolled in uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, strategy class, you actually did the... DCT project and for this project what I would like for you guys to do those because there's a handful of you that are new versus those of you that obviously went through the project and kind of some of the things associated with industrial development that are different unique that sort of thing you kind of went through that whole process I'd like for you to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that you learned with respect to industrial development because I would expect Right now, you guys are probably pretty well versed, those of you that were in there last semester, on a lot of the unique issues related to industrial development and kind of how it's different from some of the other forms of development that we've been talking about. So let's spend a, a few minutes of you guys, you know, one of you guys w that want to give just a, a brief overview of the DCT project. Don't, I don't need slides or anything like that, but, but just sort of talk us through what kind of project it was, but then more specifically get into what were some of the key four or five issues that you sort of, the takeaways, if you will, from the project itself. So which one of you folks want to kind of give us the quick overall briefings? Mark. Don't bring it up, man. Come on, Mark. <laughs> Mark. Okay. You don't have to come up here. I just want, I just want you know, give us give us your perspective of of what the, the the project was about, what and then ultimately let's just start with that. What was the project? Yeah. It was a uh, vacant property and over by uh, the Miami Airport District submarket. It was uh, it, like eight acres. How how big was it, Mark? Yeah, there's 200,000 square feet. No, no. Anyways, they wanted they, it's it was it's zoned for industrial, and that's what they want to put there. So what DCT was looking for is how did they differentiate their product amongst all the other industrial that's not only going up in their submarket, but also in the neighboring submarkets. And there is a lot of industrial product coming online, millions and millions of square footage. And so what they wanted to know is. How can they make theirs stand out among all the other players? Okay, and, 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 okay so let's kind of go okay. down that road just a little bit. In your mind, what would be, not of their site specifically, but overall for industrial property, what would you say are maybe the top five key success factors for an industrial property? I'm asking you. You went through the project, what would you say those are? Um, the things that you evaluated and thought about. Access. Okay. And here we're talking about access to highways, Support. airports, trains. trains. Okay. Pretty much everything. Okay. You know, access to we'll the CBD, depending. But the, the point being is you're looking how well position or located is this relative to the other competing projects. Okay. All right. What else? Ceiling heights. Design. Ceiling heights. And you guys obviously did a great job with kind of the whole explanation of the issues surrounding the ceiling heights. So what are the, the big issues with the ceiling heights? The older buildings don't have high ceilings. So their cubic foot capacity of holding cargo inside the building is limited so they're making all the newer buildings 
the same footprint, but they're able to hold more capacity uh, as far as cargo inside it. And with the newer technology, with the forklifts able to go down narrower aisles and, and go up taller, uh, that's kind of where it's trending because people are, tenants are still paying a per square foot price for their for the buildings. They're not paying per cubic foot. Yeah, that actually brings up an interesting question. Should they maybe be paying on a per oh. cubic foot basis? Okay. You know? Well, no. the, what? Sorry. It depends on the use. Right. On what they, what they're if storing. They're using this industrial facility for storing cargo, then that's a, probably a good way. Okay. But the idea is, is that they're getting higher rents because the buildings are, you know, bigger. But if you could take a 20 foot ceiling and make it a 40 foot ceiling, should it be paying double? Right. Because they're able to fill it double, which they're not paying double for. Yeah, it just and goes up. the cost to build just that incremental 20 extra feet is really not that much more because, you know, all your development costs are... It, it, gets, back, it gets back to an accuracy of pricing. Right. I mean, you know, in, I, I think it's a very valid sort of, of issue. You know, as the market evolves, would you expect that is probably going to be the case? That, that you know, yes, historically it has been on the square foot, but part of the idea was that the space is almost, you're, you're indifferent to one versus the other because traditionally industrial space has just been, you know, kind of thought of as generic warehouse space and not a lot of attention was given to those, well, because most of the space was same, the same. And so now that it is differentiated, you know, with the ceiling heights and possibly other factors, you know, should you be pricing it differently on the market to reflect that difference? Okay? And then other, one of the other things that you guys began to investigate whenever it came to the ceiling heights was, is the cost to actually build it taller cost efficient with respect to the dollar amount in return that you're receiving in rent? Right? Right. Okay. All right, so what else? Hey, Other, can I ask a question yep. on this? Just from perspective, when you uh, rent out a warehouse, do they come with the racks already in the warehouse? Usually not. No, it's just oh, a shelf. Okay. So by, if you had a warehouse and you built the racks inside, could you probably benefit on that? that way financially? Probably not. I mean, because it, you know, the, every, every tenant's going to have a little bit different use. Oh, like, okay. Oh, this you know, and, and or maybe they want to make a section of a cold storage and, and dry goods, or you know, mm. they need different aisle configurations, or they want different rack heights because then also there's I forget the size of the racks, but there's like three different size racks. So you have like a 52 inch rack, a 36 inch rack. So one may be used more than the other. The yeah, they just use there. them. You know, like maybe um, washer and dryers take. If you're selling washer and dryers, they take the 56 inch rack. But if you're selling tissue paper, you know, they're smaller rack sizes. Okay. All right. So, number three, what would you say is key success factors? Yep. The number of like bays or doors. Okay. Number and size, probably. Too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Energy efficiency. Especially lighting. Okay, for lighting. And whether you even need it at all, in some cases, because it depends on how automated the, the warehouse is. Um, you've got robots basically right, yeah. basically loading, unloading, and, and repositioning stuff that you may not even need the lighting. But yes, the, the big thing of just simply, you know, what are your, your lighting costs for the, the space? Okay, what else? Um, maybe with the cost of land, like coverage ratios, probably be important. Okay, um, sort of uh, density. Yeah. Is that what you're sort of saying? Yeah. Well, because one of the issues with the site that we did was that there wasn't really a lot of different ways to configure the space, and so it forced them to be deeper, which isn't ideal because then it decreases, you know, the number of tenants bays or, and the number yeah. of tenants and all of that. So. The coverage on the site is important. So like the okay. site layout. So yeah, the site yeah. configuration yeah. would be really important. Density on the site and site configuration. All right. And the truck ports, the private truck ports. 
which would probably also fit in there as well. Okay. Is five sufficient, or do you think there's there's any others that? I mean, there's a couple mentioned? others. Like um, one of the things some folks were looking for a lot was this idea of being in, you know, like a foreign trade zone. Okay. There, the idea is it'd be some tax relief and and uh, uh, potentially to the tenants if they're uh, potentially uh, not just simply receiving and, and shipping out, but also doing manufacturing on site. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? That pretty much covers it. Hey, I'm sorry. Parking. Okay. Well, no, it's sort of truck ports. I guess would be the parking. Or the, mm -hmm. Been one of the big uh, concerns. Um, okay. Anything else? Feel pretty comfortable with that? Price? Sure. Well, key success, but yeah. Put that in there. Security part of it? Watch the trucks? Security? Yeah, I think that, that can be in there. Absolutely, in the mix. Okay. So now, were there any other things where you were comparing one of the industrial parks against another that maybe didn't fall so much in a key success factor but was a comparison a uh, factor of comparison between okay yeah what whether you had refrigerated space on site or didn't okay um, and how much refrigeration spike or refrigeration space that you had okay anything else you sort of compare? Okay, the, the type of tenants or specifically, okay, what type of tenants would be attracted to that particular type of space, all right? One of the big things that we looked into was the truck ports. Private, the what, I'm sorry? The private versus shared truck ports. Okay. Because that seemed like, from the brokers, it was really important for, um, for the tenants like to have, they like the, the private truck ports. They prefer, they have more control. Absolutely. And it gets very, especially if you have multiple tenants, the, the traffic in the back is very like, right. hectic. Territorial so, and, yeah. So, what's, um, what's truck works? That's a, the, most of the way the sites were laid out were shared. So you had two buildings with a shared, like where the trucks come in and out to, oh. to load the back of the buildings. Okay. And the way this particular site laid out, they had private ones, which was a big yeah. asset. And, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So... Okay, now beyond the sort of the success factors and more on the kind of the lessons learned sort of thing, what sort of things did you sort of run across that, I don't know, was either new information to you or surprising to you or useful to you? I know you're tired. Help me get through this. Come on. I was surprised how inexpensive it is to build those buildings. That's helpful. You were surprised about that? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I've never done a wall, but well, yeah, there's not a lot. Yeah, there's not a lot of labor. I mean, forty-five dollars you know, a square foot. They're building the building for it. It's a square. Yeah. It's shell. Not a lot of finish out. There's enough of those four walls. Right. It's very basic. No, no. I mean, it is. I mean, it's interesting I'm not, because I won't say anything else if you guys are making. Not at all. No. <laughs> But, but you know, it, 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 it's, it's a point very well taken. I mean, you know, all of your background has been, you know, on the residential side of things, where you know, finish out is almost everything. And with industrial, you're just a shell. You know, it, it can't get much more basic than than a shell. And you really do begin to sort of see how much of a, you know, I guess a cost add all of those finishes are. You know, efficiency of the building is 100. For the most part, yeah, because this is one big open space. One big, yeah, you know, AC stuff that. You know, and you know, you may air condition it, you may not. You know, it all depends to a certain extent. You know, on what that particular tenant may very well need. You know, is are you shipping perishable goods? Is it just you know, tractor parts or you know something that you know really doesn't matter. You know, as long as it's covered, it's okay. You know, so it's it's, it's a really interesting sort of use. Um, but that also kind of then brings in a, okay, so 
setting that sort of project aside for them a second, or is there, well, before we do that, is there anything else that in terms of a, the lesson learned? I don't want to do industrial. <laughs> you don't want to do industrial, okay. It's hard to get, it's hard to be unique. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty generic. I mean, and as I was worth saying that, you know, historically it has been very generic kind of space because it's hard to get super creative whenever it comes to, you know, you're just storing stuff or doing a little bit of maybe light manufacturing and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, from that standpoint, not a lot of creativity involved, you know, and a lot of, you know, development minded folks, you know, tend to want to have a little bit of a creative touch to things not a whole lot of flourishes that you can really put on, you know, an industrial property. I mean, there are a few, but not a whole lot. I think as the standards become like the higher ceiling heights and, you know, the buildings do become more like normalized again. So like all the Class A product is going to be above this height and, and that the location is really the key to the success of the product because, you know, building A and building B are exactly the same right. and the location is what's going to make you decide on you know, which one you're going to sign the lease at. Okay, fair enough. All right, anybody else? Frederick, you had something? Yeah, well, I was going to ask you, what's coming down the pipeline in the future for, for the, uh, the product? Is it ever going to look different? Is there any? Well, and that's part of, I think, the, you know, the whole discussion of, of what we were sort of you know, alluding to. You know, do you have more of this space that's just automated? You know, once again, it's just going to be a bunch of robots, you know, unloading trucks and moving materials, putting them on the shelves, taking them off the shelf preparing them in some way, you know, and sending them off on another truck kind of thing. And, uh, you know, that, you know, certainly in certain aspects of, of, the, of the industrial market, you know, that whole distribution aspect of how much more that process gets automated. Well, that'll, that'll increase your construction costs. But Absolutely. But other than that, I mean, there's no operational cost then. Right. Or very little okay. by comparison. I mean, it's important to know that I think like this sort of evolution into these highest ceiling heights is something very recent too. Isn't yeah. It? And um, more high efficiency um, industrial parks is something that's really just. Yeah, and, and, and I guess another thing that might be of interest, and once again, you know, I'm this is an area where I'm really you know, very little knowledge of, but like for example, like the strength of materials with regard to like the concrete floors. Mm -hmm. You know, do you have folks out there that are working on stronger, thinner concrete, you know, where you maybe have to have less of a pour, but yet the, the, the strength of it is sufficient to be able to, to, to handle the increased weight for these increased ceiling heights, you know, things like that. You know, you can kind of imagine, you know, being very important. Um, you know, could you, uh, you know, even get to the point of, not just you know the ceiling heights within that one building. You know, having two-story or three-story industrial buildings. You know, they certainly exist out there. You know, kind of really old-school sort of stuff of, of facilities that were used for industrial purposes. They're multi-story, um, but you know, to what extent? Yet again, you know, does that kind of get into you know as the process gets more and more automated? You know, does it make sense to potentially even do that? And I think it, it brings a, a lot of. Uh, Credence or validity to what you mentioned before, where you can take this product and make it a more mixed use type product because it's cheaper construction. That right. may be something that. Right, and I think you know, certainly with those older industrial properties, I mean, that's why so many of them have been, um, you know, kind of at the forefront of adaptive reuse is simply because, um, you know, you've got a very solid structure. You know, concrete walls, concrete floors, concrete ceilings, doesn't get much more solid than that. And ultimately then just a matter of kind of delineating the spaces, you know, with inside that to create alternative, you know, whether it's office space or residential or, you know, some other sort of mixed use. And, you know, have been really good. Uh, um, uh, also, you know, a lot of them would have, you know, really kind of interesting kind of character and, and uh, sort of appearance that the older structures, that is the ones from the early 1900s, that um, would make them you know, very appealing for that kind of use. Is it easier to get loans in this industry on this product? No, I don't know that it's easier. I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting sales job for you to make the, the pitch to 
a group of investors or a lender to do kind of an adaptive reuse of an industrial property. One of the biggest concerns that people are going to have with quote unquote the adaptive reuse aspect of industrial contamination. You know, was there something that was done on that site at some point in the past that was bad, bad, evil, evil? You know, and to the extent that you can find that out and make sure that it's not going to pose a significant threat to future tenants of that space. Um, that, like, for example, like if you had a, a car repair shop or something and they were constantly pouring, you know, gasoline and oil and everything into the drains and, and then, you know, they just potentially didn't, um, you know, what extent, you know, there may be some issues of benzene or whatever that, you know, potentially be, you know, problematic. That's you know certainly a concern. Or you had a dry cleaners that once again the fluids that they used potentially you know is there you know some possibility for um, where uh, uh, you know might contaminate the space in some way. So those kinds of things are usually um, some of the, the biggest concerns with those sort of industrial properties of turning them into residential uses, especially you know or lead-based paint or whatever else it might be. I think as far as future trends, another thing to look out for is as like online shopping and things like that increase. The, so does the need gonna for be, it. Well, there's going to be a, an increased need, but also an increased need for like um, more facilities that are more spread out so that they can have the product to the consumer in a faster mm -hmm. amount of time. Because well, if you have a warehouse in one location, then you know you can't get it. Right. You know. What did you see? The, the latest with Amazon. What they are doing on the college campuses are starting this new concept of where they will have a delivery center on college campus. I'm trying to remember now which university, you guys may have read the article, came out like a week or two ago, um, but one of the, the college campuses somewhere here, obviously in the U.S., that's their first test site, but the idea behind it is that anything that you, if you lived on the college campus, anything that you ordered from Amazon would automatically be shipped there that would cut down on obviously their shipping cost and also would, would increase the, the, the time, or not increase the time, but, but in, well, decrease the amount of time that it took to, to actually get there. And it would be just purely a kind of a, you know, you show up and show your receipt or whatever, pick up the merchandise and go, you know. And uh, um, I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, as a concept. Now, part of the reason that obviously you think about college campuses is because you have all those kids living on the campus. And um, you know, instead of trying to deliver to dorm rooms and you know, just nightmarish, you know, kind of I'm sure experiences they've had in that respect, that you know, this would be you know one way to potentially kind of alleviate some of those concerns. But also, those are the folks doing a lot of the online ordering of textbooks, of you know, clothes, whatever it might be, music, you know, whatever. And ultimately, they can come you know pick it up there. So I mean, what do you think about that as a concept? as a new kind of retail use, but yet all at the same, same time, it's really, in, in a certain extent, kind of almost industrial as well. I think for a college campus, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how it could be implemented as like a scale in, you know, Fort Lauderdale or Miami as are people going to go somewhere to like an Amazon store to pick up their products, but Walmart is doing that now where you can order online and tomorrow you can pick it up in the store. Right. So, so why don't pick it up if they can deliver it right to your door? Because it might be three day shipping and it's free if you pick it up in the store, which is a mile and a half away. Well, I mean, I agree. I'm just saying, what's the incentive to? Right. Especially. No, and I, I think that that is also part of the incentive built into it that it is free shipping in that case automatically. Yeah. It's and it might be a little quicker. It might just be online. Online. Yeah, yeah. But at the it same time, online. yeah, it might just be an online product that maybe is something that might not be a big seller. I mean, I'm just hypothetical. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's something that's not inherently a big seller. It's maybe a rel relatively unique piece of merchandise that just doesn't, you know, maybe they sell one every, you know, two months kind of thing if it were in the store, but online, you know, they're, they actually would sell enough volume to actually make sense to then just send it to the, the folks that actually want it. You know, I think for, for, yeah, for basic normal sort of goods, not so much, but for those goods that are maybe a bit more unique and or you 
really want something, like I said, just a little bit out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. I think it makes a lot of sense to um, you know allow for that. Walmart has the online only products, so those too. you can get ships through the stores. Right. But a lot of those, as I said, are somewhat yeah. unique or different or special or whatever it is, that, and that's part of the reason why they do that. Because as a retailer, you know, turnover of product is really important. You know, in other words, how quickly you turn that merchandise over and keeping something in inventory just to have it in inventory, not necessarily, you know, a good thing. So if you can kind of look at, you know, the whole U.S. market as being, you know, you only have one location that you have to store whatever item this is, and, you know, as the person who needs that weird item, you, you want to stock it, but at the same time, and you want to sell it, but it doesn't really make sense to maybe stock it in every single store. Right? Whatever, <laughs> you know, or... Sometimes they don't have your size. Right, well, it could be you know, want, awkward, awkward sizes of clothes, uh, you know, could be, you know, situations of, of you know, certain, uh, you know, products that maybe are maybe a bit obsolete, whatever. Okay. But also a lot of students aren't allowed to have a car there. Like at Florida State, oh, you yeah. can have a car for the you first year. You 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 well, especially, yeah, if you have a high international student population, yeah. especially, then that can make a, a huge difference as well. Because, I mean, certain campuses that I've taught at in the past, you know, most of the international students live on campus. Right. And live with, or certainly within walking distance of campus. And shopping may not be available within walking distance of campus. And so this would be a, you know, a great way for them to, to be able to access those goods and services. And then certainly with some universities that are the more super traditional, maybe located in places that are much more rural, out of the way, that you know, having those sort of deliveries really do make sense because they don't have maybe the big box retailer sitting down the street. Um, it's available to them. So yeah, I think that's, in, that's in all. In New York, I think they have a couple of Amazon pickup stores as well. But you can order just in the city. Right. Just go and pick, pick your stuff up. Okay. All right. Yep. And I was just going to make the point about like the Amazon. I think that's a really like cool idea. I do I like it. But as far as like the university stores, the like the reason I used to order offline is because it was a lot less expensive. It yes. might take longer. But if I might like if I really need something, I knew that I could just go to the bookstore and get it like right. that day. But if they're making it where you can get it the next day and you don't have to wait three to five or however many days right no absolutely we're going to shut down right right they shut down right no absolutely there's no question they'll make up the money at least to amazon there we go right okay all right so other issues on the industrial side of things okay other sort of trends issues thoughts on the industrial stuff how much is is lead certification and what times you know sort of like an issue with industrial I just don't see it as, as being that dramatic because the only thing that you're, I mean, unless you've got a super water intensive use or a super, you know, ele electrical sort of use, but, but even then that's going to be almost more machinery than anything, you know, I don't see it as being that prevalent. I mean, I think, you know, within maybe an industrial structure, you might have some office space that you might want to make lead certified, but I just don't see it as being the predominant kind of, of beneficiary, if you will, of, of sort of lead certification. I mean, to me, lead certification, the biggest, most dominant use is going to be office, and I, it, no, hospitality would be sort of the next one, because hospitality, a lot of those properties are going to be effectively owner-occupied, and so they're going to have much more of an incentive to try to cut down their costs. But the, the, the thing, well, and that's actually an interesting point to make, I would argue that a lot of the hospitality folks will seek the cost savings from doing the energy efficient things, but they may not really have as much of a benefit to be derived from actually getting the designation. Mm -hmm. Because the office buildings, there it's like, well, yeah, you're leasing it to a tenant that, once again, may have a corporate, you know, kind of mandate that they must occupy lead certified space, but I don't see that really happening in the hotel side of the, the, the business. There, you know, even if you did have a corporate mandate, I would imagine it's, 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 that would be a lot more challenging to kind of enforce. Internationally, there's a lot of benefits. 
in the U.S. I don't see any benefit. Um, there's a lot of tax incentives, uh, even mortgages. You can drop two points, three points, just by being lead certificate international. Right. Um, but domestically, not so much. Domestically, yeah. no. Yeah. There's even there's certain countries that you can get 75 percent your investors, 75 uh, percent, let's say rebate on their taxes. Right. Um, mm. If they invest in a sustainable lead certificate level. Mm. Okay. All right. Here, no. Yep. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts or comments on the industrial stuff? No. Okay. So, um, I think we've covered most every issue on that. So, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the test. I told you. My plan. 25 questions of your two hour test. Effectively, you'll have 10 questions that are computation based. Once again, predominantly focused on sort of, of financial feasibility of development projects, whether it's um, you know, in calculating a lot of that information by hand. I may have a couple of, of questions that we will be able to use the Excel models that I provided, but those will once again kind of like the finance test will be sort of done separately, okay? So you'll still need to do certain calculations by absolutely by hand. Um, the other 15 questions will be conceptual and what I will probably do on those um, is I will go back and specifically kind of look through the videos and sort of say, okay, I, I pretty much know what I've talked about, know what I've covered. What are the concepts that we covered? And then what I, I mean, at an absolute minimum, what you should do is anything, anything that I wrote words down, okay, on the board, on the screen, whatever, you need to probably read a little bit in the book about those things. Especially if you did not fully understand what those things were. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, so as an example, what is tax increment financing? We talked about it. Now the question is, can you answer me a question as to what it is? Maybe, maybe not, but if you go and you read in the book, you'll find out. You follow? Okay, so at a minimum, that's what I would do if I were you in terms of trying to prepare for the test. Because I would argue we probably have covered at least 75 to 100 different topics. You've got to effectively go back and kind of take a look at what those topics were and ultimately kind of delve into them, maybe, in some cases a little bit deeper. In other cases, if you were paying attention and you took good notes, you're good. But if you just sat there and weren't really paying attention, weren't really, you know, in, engaging in the thought process and in the discussion, you're not going to do all that well. Simple as that. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So at this point, we're done with the lecture for today. What you now can do for the remaining time is to the extent that you need to. I know at least those two groups in the back probably need to spend a little bit more time working on their presentations and talking a little bit more about Project Pro. Um, I think the group up here and y'all's group, y'all are pretty, pretty much done. We also went over some of that at the beginning. We need to go back to that as well. Okay. I'll see you next week. Thank mm -hmm. you.